Good morning, good morning, good morning. And I've been forced to make this podcast today. Forced, I tell you. You have to watch out for him, because he's got a small tractor. He's got a very wide topper on the back. Grass cutter. It's that time of year where you cut the grass because it's run out of steam. So to cut it, it's not going to grow long anymore. So, no, I've been forced to make this podcast because they're talking about women's football on the TV, on the radio, and, you know, whether or not it's... uh, So, and the question was, you know, women's football, England in the quarterfinals, Euro figures at a record, which is probably not, you know, it's not, it's not at all. There's a little tip for you, right? If you're, if you're dealing with a, something that's a very, very minority interest or something in which people are showing little or no interest, you always talk about the percentage increase in the figures. Because, you know, if you've only got like a thousand viewers and you go up to 1,200 viewers, you can cry about having a 20% increase in your audience. Whereas it's unlikely the BBC or ITV is ever going to get a 20% increase in their audience. <laughs> very unlikely so uh, so what you do then you say you know we're the uh, biggest uh, the fastest growing phenomenon on TV uh, well what you mean is that nobody watches it and now nearly nobody watches it so and the other thing you can do is you can just appeal to things that don't uh, involve figures at all so for example you can say we're the most loved TV sports channel or we're the uh, uh, favourite dental association or whatever. So, anyway, the question was, you know, more people are watching it than ever before. Well, I mean, it's hardly surprising. You can't get away from it. And the BBC, which has absolute love and affinity for sport, which produces hours and hours and hours of mostly nothing with a little bit of excitement uh, has really adopted women's football and, and also it needs to be dirt cheap you know as in they'll almost pay you for the privilege of being on the BBC and uh, the, the original uh, sport that fulfilled those was uh, snooker of course uh, snooker you've got like every match takes half an hour and uh, you can have obviously uh, rankings and tables and competitions and uh, they fill up entire weeks culminating in uh, bank holiday weekends with snooker or they did originally I can remember when they started putting so much snooker on the telly people were complaining saying oh you're just you're just filling our screens up with rubbish you know very very cheap mostly boring an unexcited minority sport and um, and they're doing the same with women's football now I don't this is not a gender identity thing I would object to them putting the same amount of men's football on the television I you know I, I, stayed, I stayed at a house a friend of mine young, younger friend of mine I met through Bitcoin and uh, he's now bought himself a nice house and he invited me to stay up there and he's got all his friends staying over there they've got no children so it's it's like uh, just a big uh, hostel you know and uh, one of the guys there was watching uh, the Formula One on the on the laptop and he sort of said to me you know are you interested in Formula One and I said well I'm not really because but I was when I was your age, you know, but not so much now. I'm in my 60s, he's in his 20s. And, uh, you know, and that was a bit of a, I was a bit unkind to say that, you know. But they are used to that, actually. Because a few of them are autistic, and so they do tend to say what they think. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can only watch the Formula One for so many years before you realise that it's just a bunch of blokes driving around in circles and see who can drive around in circles the fastest <laughs> and uh, and everything you know pretty much everything's the same with football you uh, punt the ball up and down 
and see if you can get it in the net at the other end. And then at the end of the year, you reset the points and you start it all again. And some people say it's a quasi battle, you know, it's better than the uh, half of Manchester going to fight the other half of Manchester with uh, sticks with nails in. But, you know, actually, personally, I'd find that more exciting. And most sports are like that, you know, you realise that sports are, they're engineered, they are part of this Bread and Circuses Act, which is the, uh, it's wobbling about a lot, isn't it, that camera? Let me just see if I can move it a bit. That's going to muck, no, it's still wobbling about. It's going to muck up my framing, that is now. Oh. Anyway, hopefully the anti-wobble features of the camera will, uh, will stop that. So, what, I was gonna, what I'm going to talk about is, I've just been on holiday for a couple of weeks, and when you're self-employed, if you've got a ton of money in the bank, then you can afford to go on holiday over the, the month end, but if you haven't, then you have to sort of more or less, how can I put it, having two weeks off can make quite a big difference to your cash flow. Let's say you're on a moderate income of... I don't know, somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand thousand a month single handed. So you are like by most dentist definitions that's a that's a, a shoestring operation, okay? And for all anyone who's listening from the daily mail, I'm talking about turnover here, not profit. Right? Profit is on that will be very low. In fact, if you pay the dentist properly, there'll be no profit on that. So then to have two weeks off out of that, you know, a four and a half week month, you're looking at a loss of about seven and a half thousand pounds. And that's because dentists are paid on a pay as you go basis, you know, as a sort of a fee for item basis. Um, I know uh, that you'll say, well, a lot of dentists are, have an NHS contract and so the money comes in whether they're working or not. And the, that is true, that the money comes in whether they're working or not, but the work doesn't get done whether they're working or not. So this is reminds me of something my hygienist used to say to me, which is that uh, she used to, if someone hadn't been in for a scale of polish for a year or a couple of years or something, she used to, she used to charge them twice as much. Uh, and it was really her justification was to try and encourage them to come in regularly and not save money by uh, deferring their scale and polishing until they thought that they could get what they considered better value which is you know perhaps having more, more scaling done catching up two years worth of scaling for the same fee as catching up with one year's worth of scaling and so she used to charge them more and so I can understand the thinking behind that, but uh, at the end of the day, you're, you know, it doesn't take you twice as long to scale someone's seat if they haven't been for two years. It might take you a bit longer, but you can adjust your fees for that in the overall scheme of things. And leave those people who want to come in regularly, who appreciate having a scale and polish frequently, uh, to, to pay a you know, the premium that that would involve um, to pay slightly over the odds if you then get the pricing right for people who come in at the interval, which is they most like usually adopt, you know, even if that's 18 months or five years or what, you know, whatever. Oh, somebody on a motorbike. That's what I should be on a motorbike. I've been coming in on the, uh, on the scooter. Not since I've been on holiday. Anyway, so so I was off from the, uh, I don't know, the 14th or 28th or something. What's it now? Or the 20, 28th to the 14th or something. So we ended up with a perfect storm, really, with a, in, in terms of the finances, because the Inland Revenue had uh, £7,000 off me in corporation tax. They then took the quarterly payroll payment off me which is 3,000 quid or something 
then I got Nest uh, Bloodsuckers draining me £600 a month. Well, I say draining me, I mean they drain the practice. This is why I always, when I'm working out, you know, how much it costs to pay the staff, I always look at the total cost of ownership, the TCO, because there are a bunch of expenses that you wouldn't incur if you didn't employ a certain member of staff. For example, you wouldn't have to pay into their pension, you wouldn't have to pay into the employer's part of their national insurance, um, and this all uh, comes off the pot which is available for their wages. So while they might end up with, I don't know, 1,500, two grand a year or something, uh, a month, you know, the actual total cost of ownership of that person is, let's say, 3,500, and that's what it costs you. And therefore, that's the, the hurdle that they have to pass. They have a, a hurdle rate, which is, in terms of productivity, they have to generate at least their total cost of ownership every month, uh, not what they take home. And that the TCO is a very much higher figure so that might be why, you know, uh, staff uh, don't quite appreciate that when rates go up, let's say employers' national insurance goes up, and the staff, uh, well, like, well, okay, that's fine. That's the business, you know, you pay that, I don't pay that. Uh, but the trouble is that they do. I mean, they do pay that. That all goes into their TCO. Or if compulsory pension contributions goes up. And they're like, oh, that's great. My business is going to put more into my pension. Well, no, you're, you're, you end up putting that in because that's included in your TCO and your TCO will go up. And that increases the hurdle rate for employing you. And it increases the uh, productivity that we require of you. And it requires the amount of work that you have to do to stay employed with us. So... So that, if you're an employer or an employee, then just bear in mind that that's the way things work. Now, when you have some time off, chances are that you're not really going to defer any work, okay? So take, for example, the DPAS uh, scheme. Now, DPAS is good because it does provide you with a constant income every month. So for example, I will have got 3,000, say, pounds in from my DPAS patients in the month that I took the holiday, of which I was there half the time. So I've had 1,500 pounds uh, when I was working and 1,500 pounds when I wasn't. But then the question arises of whether or not all the work that you would have had to have done in the interim while you're away it just needs doing when you get back I mean have you negated the need to do the work or have you simply deferred it uh, and in most cases I've got to say my hygienist has got a point I have simply deferred it so all the DPAS patients who were due to have a checkup in late July early August who haven't had them they'll just be booked into late late August so uh, I then I then you then find that you've got a period where all you're doing is you're just earning the income that that's been deferred that what the income's not been deferred but the work's been deferred and that's the same with an NHS contract that's what I'm saying your income is not deferred but your uh, sorry your your yeah no your income is not deferred but the work is just deferred because you have to do as much <clears throat> as many UDAs uh, at, by, the, by the end of the year, the fact that you've just had a break from doing UDAs doesn't make any difference to this, the system. It still expects the same number, whether you worked uh, 250 days of the year or, or merely 50. So that, that just helps with the cash flow. Now, the DPAS income, as far as we're concerned, is not our main source of income. So, so while it's nice to have and does assist in a positive way with the cash flow, it doesn't really solve the problem of uh, two weeks no income. 
And in the old days when everyone was feet for item, uh, you know, people didn't used to go to the uh, BDTA exhibition because they were, they calculated how much a day off work cost them. And if it cost them say 300 quid, and then another 300 quid to take the staff there, they looked at that as a 600 pound expenditure and said, no, I'd rather have the uh, work the day, you know, just work the day. That's why the attendance on Saturday was so great because uh, people would never go there on Thursday or Friday. They would, uh, and it, they would go on the day that they didn't work, which was the Saturday. So I've got this massive great problem on the uh, cash flow front on the outgoings. And uh, and no income for two weeks, so it's all been a bit humorous to be honest. I've got I had about twelve thousand pounds in the account a month ago, and then just as I come back off an holiday, I got a letter from Lloyd's saying saying I'm a hundred pounds overdrawn, and that they're going to charge me fifteen quid. And every time, or is it, no, I'm more than 50 pounds overdrawn, that's right. And every time I go further 50 pounds overdrawn, they're gonna charge me another 15 pounds. So in other words, for every 50 pounds I draw out, I'm paying 30% of the amount that I'm obtaining as a, as a fine. You know, and they can't help but annoy you because uh, the way Lloyds does it is that they send you a letter saying you're overdrawn and that's really uh, you know designed to cost you money because you'll never get the letter in time to stop yourself going overdrawn now let me tell you how HSBC handles it if you're what you've authorized for payment during the day exceeds your limit they will email you during the day and say look you need to put this right by midnight 10 o'clock or whatever our settlement date or or you're going to get a uh, fine, you know. So if you're going overdrawn on HSBC, you get a chance to remediate the situation, rectify it. Whereas Lloyd's, you don't. Lloyd's, you'll just get a letter after about five days saying that five days ago you went overdrawn and we're charging you uh, 15 or 30% of, of all the money, you know. So you can't avoid getting fined with Lloyd's. Not unless you obsess over your balance if it's near zero and I honestly didn't think you know and it's like uh, everything else you know you think you think you've got you've taken everything into account and then all of a sudden another loan payment comes out or something and, and you're overdrawn so I don't like Lloyd's at all I don't honestly I've never liked Lloyd's they were the only bank that would give me a loan to buy this place and uh, and there were they were they behaved very badly in the when I took you know right from the very beginning they treated me very badly and they've continued to treat me very badly and now I'm in credit I'm seriously thinking about changing banks perhaps I'll change to HSBC but the main thing is to get a bit of money back into the bank account now and uh, and then take it from there but it's the first time in eight years I've gone overdrawn and I went overdrawn by about 200 quid and it's a big deal, do you know what I mean? So, so I'll let you know, if I change from Lloyd's I'll let you know. Anyway, nice to talk to you again, hope you have a nice day, bye.